Well, when I was asked a few months ago to suggest some possible subjects for Sundays in July, I sort of, sort of whimsically put this topic down on my list, uh, and to my surprise, they chose it and said they wanted to do the, the subject on the Beechers and their influence in the religious life of America from the 19th century until now, uh, which is a huge subject, I found out to my dismay once I started <laughs> preparing this. As you know, several members of the Beecher family rose to fame and influence really in the formative years of modern American evangelicalism and the indelible imprint of their beliefs and their biases and their moral blemishes is still pretty deeply embedded in American religion. And as I go through this, I think you'll understand what I mean about that. I think most of you will know something about one or two of the Beechers. I'm sure you know the name Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, she was not the only influential Beecher, and in fact, no family in America, including Billy Graham's offspring, ha has left a stronger or more lasting imprint on our social culture than the Beechers. In the middle of the 19th century, when the members of this family were at the height of their collective fame and influence, the best-known celebrity in the family was Henry Ward Beecher. He was Harriet's younger brother. He was a Congregationalist minister, pastor of Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, and the congregations in his church were similar in size to Grace Community Church. And in fact, that church building it still exists today as it did same size when Beecher preached there, and it seats something between 2,500 and 3,000 people, and it was full to capacity whenever Henry Ward Beecher was in the pulpit. There are photographs of the church full with people. And throughout his ministry, Henry Ward Beecher's influence was felt worldwide. He was generally regarded as America's best preacher, and he was certainly the best known. And uh, so that you can fit him into whatever timeline you carry in your mind, here's some dates. Henry Ward Beecher was born in 1813. He was therefore 21 years older than Charles Spurgeon. Beecher had actually already attained international fame by 1850. That was the year Spurgeon was converted. So Spurgeon was clearly aware of Beecher's widespread popularity. He was careful, Spurgeon was, not to make public criticisms about the American preacher, although Spurgeon did say in print that Beecher's book on the life of Christ was a disappointment. I'll have more to say about Spurgeon and Henry Ward Beecher if you stay with me. But we're going to look at this family from the beginning and consider their influence on American religion and especially their influence among evangelicals. And I'm going to show you that Henry Ward Beecher actually developed the pragmatic ministry philosophy that dominates the typical evangelical church today. He was instrumental in shaping the evangelical attitude towards doctrine and piety or faith and good works. And the whole Beecher family fostered America's widespread resentment towards our Puritan ancestors. So let me start by giving you three or four book recommendations. I usually do this at the end, but I'm going to do it now. This is where you should start if you want to know more about the Beecher family. The first is a book called The Beechers by Milton Rugoff. It's 650 pages long, and uh, so it's the thickest and most comprehensive of the books that I'm going to highlight. And it covers most of the key members of the Beecher family. And Rugoff spans more than 100 years of history in this book. It's a well-researched book. And I recommend it with one strong caveat, this. Milton Rugoff, the author, is theologically illiterate. He, he totally misses the importance of the vital doctrinal differences between figures like Lyman Beecher, the patriarch of this clan, and Charles Finney, who was a contemporary of both Lyman and Henry Ward Beecher, uh, Lyman Beecher's own children, who were theologically diverse, and uh, all of them with their conflicts against the ideas of our Puritan ancestors, and then the Universalists, who more or less took over 
New England religion during the era this book covers. Uh, Rugoff's own sympathies do seem to lie more with the Universalists, and that's unfortunate. It mars the book. It seriously diminishes his account of the religion and the politics of that era because he's sympathetic with the Universalists. But nevertheless, it's a well-researched book. It's rich with historical details. I recommend it if you want to study the Beechers. My second recommendation is my favorite. I give this one two thumbs up. It's a book titled The Most Famous Man in America. And it was written by Debbie Applegate. It was a Pulitzer Prize winner in 2007. And it's a superb biography of Henry Ward Beecher, who was not only the most famous of all the famous Beechers during his lifetime, he was indeed, literally, for a time, the most famous man in America. And this is a really good book. If I made a list of the, the 10 most interesting and well-written non-theological non-fiction books that I've ever read, this book would be in the first five titles on that list. It's a really good book. My third recommendation is called Henry Ward Beecher, An American Portrait, written by a man named Paxton Hibben, H-I-B-B-E-N. This is a groundbreaking book that was first published in 1927, and it was briefly something of a bestseller in its time. It was chosen about 15 years later by Sinclair Lewis and Clifton Fadiman. Uh, after its original release, they chose it to be a selection in the Reader's Club, and so it was reprinted for that. And Sinclair Lewis wrote a really spicy forward to the Reader's Club edition, and he made some pretty snide comments about Henry Ward Beecher, who he did not like. Sinclair Lewis, you know, is the author of the novel Elmer Gantry, which is a story about a lecherous charlatan who posed as an evangelist. And Sinclair Lewis himself was an atheist who despised Christianity, and he saw Henry Ward Beecher as a real-life Elmer Gantry. And, uh, and sadly, I'd have to say that he is, to a large degree, justified in making that comparison. I'll explain why I think an argument could be made, actually, that Henry Ward Beecher was actually worse than Elmer Gantry. But anyway, Paxton Hibben, the author of the book, is, is the first biographer of Henry Ward Beecher who didn't try to whitewash the famous preacher's colossal character flaws. And subsequent biographers of Beecher have dug even further into the truth about him. And frankly, Henry Ward Beecher richly deserves whatever scorn history pours on him. Although he achieved enormous amounts of popularity and public adulation in his time, it's frankly hard to come away from a study of his life with a very favorable opinion of the man's character. Again, I'll explain that as we go through the biographical information about him. But I mention those books up front because I've drawn material from all of them. All three of those books are, I think, now out of print, but you can get used copies and inexpensive reprints on Amazon, probably. Here's a fourth book set that I, that I need to at least name. Lyman Beecher's Autobiography. It's two books, two volumes. It was actually assembled and edited posthumously by his children and especially Charles Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe put it together. It's, a, it's historically significant, uh, and frankly, not particularly objective, but large sections of it even aren't really that interesting. But you can download it in free PDF format on Google Books if you're interested in reading it. It does have a lot of facts that, uh, uh, as they tell the story, that are, are quite interesting about that era. That would be the early earliest part of the 19th century, the 1800s. So with all of that out of the way, let me introduce you to the key members of the Beecher clan, and we'll start with the patriarch, Lyman Beecher. Lyman Beecher was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1775, less than a year before the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, Lyman's father was a third-generation blacksmith and his mother died shortly after his birth, so Lyman was actually raised by an uncle of his. His father really didn't seem to take much interest in him. And an interesting historical fact, the Beecher family had come to the New World in the early 1600s. 
Uh, so almost 200 years before Lyman was born, he had ancestors living in America. His great-great-grandfather, John Beecher, was the first European to die in the colony of Connecticut. But this was a hardy working-class family, and the Beechers for generations had been renowned for their strength. In Lyman Beecher's autobiography, he, he mentions that his great-grandfather could lift a barrel of cider over his head and drink from the bunghole. Now, a barrel of cider, if it's full, would weigh at least 160 pounds. Some of the barrels in that era weighed as much as 250 pounds. So if you can imagine lifting a barrel that high and drinking from it. His grandfather, Nathaniel Beecher, he said, could throw a barrel of cider onto a wagon, and his father, David, could carry the barrel into the cellar. So I think the point is he's making is that as the generations went, the men got a little bit weaker. But all of those, frankly, are impressive feats of strength. If you can imagine carrying a 160-pound barrel, even carrying it into the cellar, I'd roll it down the stairs. <laughs> but uh, Lyman inherited his family's muscle and toughness. Uh, I'll mention later that one of the things he did was uh, lift weights. But growing up under his uncle's oversight, rather than in the blacksmith's shed, Lyman developed a taste for books and study. And he entered Yale College at the age of 18. And when he graduated college in 1798, he entered the Divinity School at Yale. Now, the Great Awakening had ended more than 50 years before Lyman Beecher entered Yale Divinity School. So when, when he enrolled there in what was the equivalent of seminary, Jonathan Edwards had been dead for 40 years but one of Edwards' grandsons was the president of Yale at the time, and he became a friend and a mentor to Lyman Beecher. Timothy Dwight was his name. He was the son of Jonathan Edwards' daughter, Mary, and he was one of the leading Protestant theologians of his era, which might sound good, right? He's got this heritage from Jonathan Edwards, and he's his grandson, and he's the leading theologian of his era. But the truth is that in the second half of the 18th century, this, the very era when the United States became an independent nation, this was a period of dangerous theological decline, and the churches in New England were gradually moving away from their Puritan and biblical roots. Many of them were going all the way to Unitarianism. And after the Great Awakening fizzled out, the spiritual state of New England went into a kind of tailspin. The religion practiced in churches week after week, if you can think of this, that would, no matter what they were doing, it would seem dry and formal to people who had seen revival in its most frenzied state. And with the Revolutionary War and the founding of a constitutional government, people's minds were more focused on earthly values than on eternal truths. And Yale University was, Yale College at the time, was already 98 years old when Lyman Beecher enrolled there. And the Divinity School there was seeing the steady encroachment of deism and Unitarianism, both liberal versions of religion with a low view of scripture and a deep hostility toward Puritan doctrines. And Timothy Dwight, who had recently been installed as Yale's president, became Lyman Beecher's most important mentor and his close friend. Beecher said, I loved him as my own soul. And Alan Gelzo, who is a, a Presbyterian historian still alive today, Alan Gelzo said about that statement, I loved him as my own soul. Gelzo said, considering Beecher's capacity for self-esteem, that's saying a great deal. <laughs> Timothy Dwight was no fan of the liberalizing tendencies of deism and Unitarianism. He was a thoroughgoing Trinitarian, and he was still mostly rooted in his famous grandfather's Calvinist tradition. And he was therefore wary of these overtly sinister trends that were attacking New England theology. But nevertheless, Timothy Dwight himself was being influenced by other trends in his own theological circles and that included what was a kind of subtle departure from old school Calvinism, a, a significant drift really, sometimes nicknamed the new divinity. And without going into detail about it, I should mention 
that all of the chief proponents, the early proponents of the new divinity, all of them fancied themselves the heirs of the spiritual legacy of Jonathan Edwards. And many of them had close ties to Edwards. They were either, like Timothy Dwight, his direct offspring, or they were students that Jonathan Edwards had taught, men he had influenced. The fact is, they did not share Jonathan Edwards' views on vital doctrines like original sin and the nature of the atonement. Lyman Beecher was strongly influenced by this drift, and I would say he was, at the very best, wobbly on the doctrine of original sin. He didn't see how it was that people could be born as sinful, fallen creatures, you know, slaves held in the bondage of sin, and still be guilty before God. If I was born that way, why am I guilty? It's similar to some of the arguments we we hear today about same-sex attraction and things like that. Beecher didn't overtly attack the doctrine of original sin, as far as I know, but he didn't teach or defend the doctrine. He seemed to have uh, no answer to people who questioned the doctrine of original sin. And that defect in his doctrine had some far-reaching consequences, first in the beliefs and behavior of his own children, and then from there, through the influence of his most famous son, Henry Ward Beecher, most of North American Christianity basically began to doubt and then to attack the truth of Romans 5.18, that through Adam's transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. That's what Paul says in Romans 5.18. And the fact is, and I've said this many times if you've listened to me preach over the years, it is spiritual suicide to deny or doubt the doctrine of original sin. Anyone who rejects that doctrine enters a one-way on-ramp that will put you on that same steep theological downgrade that Spurgeon warned about. Countless churches and seminaries and even whole denominations ultimately slid into total apostasy and, and they were destroyed because of the New England theology, this so-called new divinity. And although Lyman Beecher was clearly uneasy with the doctrine of original sin, as far as I know, he never overtly denied that doctrine or any other doctrine in the Westminster Confession of Faith. That was his formal confession that he adhered to. So he didn't deny that doctrine, at least openly or in print, but nearly all of his famous children did. Now, Lyman Beecher's chief defect is that he was too interested in methodology and not concerned enough about safeguarding sound doctrine. His chief interest was revivalism. Revivalism, I use that word which I borrow from Ian Murray, who says genuine revival occurs when people are converted under powerful preaching of the truth of the gospel. But revivalism Revivalism is a distinctly American brand of showmanship and campaigning that is connected always with hype and statistics, and, and it's something altogether different from true revival. It aims to stir passions and, and draw people, but it doesn't generally result in widespread conversion, and it burns out. Lyman Beecher became obsessed with numbers and visible results and the quest for the the appearance of success actually distracted him from what Scripture refers to as matters of first importance, and particularly doctrines that seemed distasteful to unbelievers, starting with sin and the reality of human depravity. He would downplay or try to sidestep that. Sin and righteousness and judgment, that's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict unbelievers about. But like so many preachers today, Lyman Beecher had a tendency to purposely soft sell or sidestep completely sometimes the, the harder aspects of all of those doctrines. Now, he was a contemporary, as I said, of Charles Finney. Finney was, of course, the most famous revivalist of that era. Finney was 17 years younger than Lyman Beecher, and Beecher was already pastoring the first congregational church in Litchfield, Connecticut in 1825 when Finney began his meteoric rise to fame. Beecher was one of Finney's earliest and most outspoken critics. And if you've ever written any of the stuff I've written about Finney, you'll, you'll already be aware that it's my firm belief that all of Finney's errors and his theological eccentricities uh, 
basically add up to rank heresy. I'm not sure the man was even genuinely converted. And the root of the problem is Finney's own denial of the doctrine of original sin and the idea of human depravity. Now, of course, Lyman Beecher himself was wobbly on original sin. So when he criticized Finney, he did not focus his criticisms on doctrinal issues. He didn't answer Finney's attacks on original sin and human depravity and justification by faith, but instead he critiqued Finney's practices. He objected to what became known as new measures, methods like the anxious seat and other controversial practices that Finney did, like his habit of encouraging women to pray aloud in his meetings or, or the way Finney publicly would call out people from the pulpit by name for rebuke during his sermons. And above all, the, this deliberate appeal to raw emotionalism that characterized Finney. These were the new measures that Beecher complained about, and, and it wasn't the underlying doctrinal errors that he tried to correct. And I think that was a significant mistake that Lyman Beecher made. It not only weakened his critique of Finney, it also weakened his own personal resolve because he was right to, to question Finney's fitness for public ministry. Finney ought never have had to have been ordained. He didn't believe the confession of faith, and Lyman Beecher should have attacked him on those grounds, but instead he focused on the new measures rather than the doctrinal deviations. Beecher had a friend, Asahel Nettleton, also a critic of Finney's, who tried to get Lyman Beecher to see the importance of original sin, but Beecher wasn't having it. And worse, Beecher himself was enough of a pragmatist, concerned enough about numbers and visible results, so that as time went by and Finney's fame grew, Beecher began to lean more to Finney's side than to Nettleton's. In his book, Revival and Revivalism, Ian Murray says, beyond question, he says, there was a strong element of the pragmatic in Beecher. And later in the book, Ian Murray adds this, quote, Lyman Beecher's weakness was his readiness to allow his beliefs to be swayed by factors other than adherence to the word of God. The concern to be successful was too prominent a feature in his makeup, unquote. So Beecher ultimately dropped his public criticism of Finney. They never actually became friends, uh, although he did invite Finney to come and preach at times. And he borrowed some of the new measures in his own preaching so that in his diary, Lyman Beecher wrote, quote, Nettleton, who, remember, started out as his friend and his fellow critic of Finney's, Nettleton, he says, never did much good after he got crazy on the subject of original sin. Nettleton saw the importance of doctrine. Beecher had always ignored it, and he frankly didn't want to have to defend it. So Beecher became convinced uh, that the numerical success of his own revival meetings were an adequate answer to any potential theological complaints. He wrote this, quote, As for me, old and new school folks had never quarreled with me. All had gone smooth. The revivals in which I was engaged were so powerful that nobody dared, nobody wanted to oppose. So he felt like he didn't have to be doctrinally sound or, or particularly keen in his own discernment as long as he saw numerical results. He also became enamored with social reform and temperance lectures and moral lessons and sometimes even politics. He once preached a whole sermon against the sin of dueling, as if that were a widespread threat to the social order. It wasn't. But people in early America, especially between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, people were as obsessed with questions like that, questions dealing with public morality, they were as obsessed with that as people today are with sports and entertainment and whatever else is trending. That's why preachers today preach on those subjects. They're trying to hit what people are interested in. Beecher, I think, unwittingly cared too much what people thought, and he catered to public opinion. And in the next generation, then, Henry Ward Beecher would adopt an even more pragmatic methodology, and he would run to an extreme with it. You would usually get a dose of gospel truth in a 
typical sermon from Lyman Beecher, but Henry Ward Beecher would ultimately get to the point where he could preach sermon after sermon and never mention the gospel. Anyway, there were, there were some admirable, I would say many admirable qualities in Lyman Beecher's character. I don't mean to paint him as a, a bad person. I mentioned his strength. He was a lively, energetic man. He would exercise and lift weights in his office during his study breaks. He kept, he kept dumbbells in his office. You don't think of that with, you know, 19th century people, but he did. He, he would work off his own nervous energy before a sermon by swinging dumbbells. My favorite aspect of Lyman Beecher, though, was his enthusiastic love for family life. He was definitely a family man, a loving and attentive father. He was married three times. <clears throat> his first marriage was the happiest. His wife was named Roxana, and she was herself a widow. It was his first marriage, though. Roxana bore nine children to Lyman Beecher before she died at the age of 41. He married again within a year, which may sound kind of scandalous, but it wasn't in those days because you really, with nine kids especially, you needed a wife. <laughs> so it was a practical decision. He... Uh, he had a short, long-distance courtship with a woman from Boston named Harriet Porter. She was an aristocratic young woman, the daughter of a doctor from Boston. He married her about two weeks after his 42nd birthday, and she was only 27. And she had never been married before. That marriage produced then four more children and lasted almost 18 years. And Harriet Porter Beecher died in 1835 at the age of 45. One year after that, Lyman Beecher, who now was 61 years old, married one last time, this time to a widow named Lydia. They had no children together, but this third marriage was Lyman Beecher's longest. It lasted more than 26 years until Lyman Beecher himself died in 1863 at the age of 87. Now, being a father to so many children, seems like it wouldn't be easy for a pastor, especially one with Lyman Beecher's workload and the size of his family, the number of revival meetings he preached to. But by all accounts, he was an excellent father. Most of his children were intellectually prodigies in one way or another, and he constantly encouraged them and encouraged their intellectual growth. Nine of his kids grew up to write works that were published. Theodore Parker, who was one of America's most influential Unitarian theologians, wrote about Lyman Beecher, famously called him, quote, the father of more brains than any man in America. <laughs> so let's talk about the subsequent generation of Beechers, the, the kids who Lyman Beecher fathered. And I want to take them or, in order, and we'll breeze through them very quickly, most of them. And, and then I want to spend a lot of time, actually, with Henry Ward Beecher. So Lyman's first child, born in 1800, was a girl, Catherine Esther Beecher. She was an early feminist and a teacher, and she was a pioneer in working for the schooling of women and girls. So she founded a, a private girls' school in Hartford, Connecticut, and in her early 20s, she was engaged to marry a man who was a professor of mathematics at Yale. But... Before they were married, the young man died in a shipwreck off the coast of Ireland, which shattered her faith in the sovereignty of God. Neither she nor her fiancé, though they were nearing, or they were, I think, in their early 20s, both of them, neither of them had experienced conversion, which was, was something that was expected, more or less, in these Calvinistic churches. You, you didn't profess conversion until you'd, you'd had a an awakening of some kind, and she and her fiancé had not, and he died. And the idea that he might be lost and, and damned forever was so repugnant to her that she emphatically rejected those doctrines that her father had avoided, the doctrine of original sin, the idea of depravity, and the idea of eternal punishment. And so she left Congregationalism for Episcopalianism. And over the remaining years of her life, she became more and more strict in her moral views, but more and more liberal in her theology. She never married, 
She died at the age of 78, and she was the first of the Beecher children. Kind of a sad story. The second Beecher child was the first of that generation's Beecher boys. His name was William Henry Beecher. Now, all of the, all the Beecher men in that generation, all of them became ministers at their father's urging. Most of them were clearly not called or qualified to be ministers, and William, the first one, failed spectacularly. He didn't seem to get along with people very well. In fact, he did get married, and writing in his diary about the wedding, this is what he recorded. These are his words, quote, was married, no company, no cake, no cards, nothing pleasant about it. <laughs> Sounds like he would make a great husband and a great pastor, right? <laughs> And he moved from church to church with uh, almost constantly because he had so many conflicts with his own parishioners. And his life and ministry were so filled with trouble and strife, he was known as William the Unlucky, which isn't a very Calvinistic nickname, is it? But there you go. He was second. The third Beecher child was also a son, Edward Beecher. Now, Edward grew up to become the only qualified pastor of all the Beecher offspring. He was a better old-school Protestant than his own father. He pastored the historic Park Street Church in Boston for three years. Then he ministered in Illinois for 14 years, and he ended his years of ministry in Brooklyn with a stint at the Parkville Church, which was not far from where his younger brother Henry was pastoring at the time. Henry was more famous, but Edward was the superior theologian of the family. And he recognized that his own father and the new divinity had taken a wrong turn when they denied or ignored the doctrine of original sin. And so in his signature book, which is titled The Conflict of the Ages, he warned that by balking at affirming the doctrine of original sin, the new divinity men had more or less denied the true fallenness of the human race and by doing that, by denying that the, the race itself is fallen, they, they at least undermined, if not eliminated, the, the sense people have of a need for a savior. And so he said, and these are his words, to deny original sin is, quote, to sweep away the true and deep doctrine of human depravity and satanic influence and to leave only a nominal and superficial depravity. And he was right about that. And although all of Lyman Beecher's sons became ministers, Edward is the only one, really, who ought to have been a pastor and was probably a pretty good one. There's not a whole lot left about him, but what, what we do know about him is generally positive. The fourth of Lyman's children was a second girl, Mary Foote Beecher. Mary's reputation was that she was the best behaved of the Beecher kids. She taught in her sister's girls' school, began teaching when she was only 13 years old, and then before she turned 20, she married an attorney, and for the rest of her life, she stayed out of the public limelight, which is an unusual choice for any Beecher. And so, again, she we don't know a lot about her. She didn't do much that was recorded, but she seems to have been a, a sweet lady. Child number five was also a girl named Harriet, but she died in infancy. So there's nothing more to say about her. The child after that, number six, was George Beecher. George is the most tragic tale in the Beecher story. He studied for the ministry and served in churches in Rochester, New York, and Chillicothe, Ohio. And in July of 1843, when he was just 34 years old, he was found dead in his garden with a gunshot wound from his own gun. And his immediate family insisted it must have been an accident, but it was almost certainly suicide. And in fact, he was one of two of Lyman Beecher's children who died by suicide. We'll get to the other one in a minute. But the seventh child of Lyman Beecher was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now, notice, she was given the same first name as the child who died in infancy, Harriet. This Harriet was, of course, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. She has retained her fame longer than any of the other siblings, including Henry, even though his fame certainly overshadowed hers in their lifetime. 
Lyman Beecher recognized Harriet's superior aptitude and as well as her eccentricities. When she was just eight years old, Lyman Beecher wrote to his brother-in-law, quote, Harriet is a great genius. I would give $100 if she was a boy and Henry was a girl. <laughs> he says, she is as odd as she is intelligent and studious. And it's true, she had eccentricities. If we had more time, I'd get into them. But I'll just say, Harriet Beecher was indeed a genius. She was married to Calvin Stowe, who was a professor of biblical literature. She got married at age 25, but her faith was not exactly rock solid. She was 32 years old when her brother George shot himself. This was nearly a decade before she wrote her famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And her brother's death by suicide severely shook her faith. After all, he was a minister. How could he take his own life? And Harriet had always been, I think, more sure of her brother's faith than she was of her own faith. And his death by his own hand not only shattered that assumption, it made her worry about her future and her faith. And in fact, two years later, in a letter to another brother, Thomas, Harriet Beecher Stowe said this, quote, the sudden death of George shook my whole soul like an earthquake. And she went on to describe in detail how this tragedy had caused her to doubt her own faith. She said, am I even a Christian? Those are her words. She says, it must be that I am not a Christian. Something said to me, you're a Christian, perhaps, but not a full one. She just could not reconcile a tragedy, a sinful tragedy like that, with her own Calvinist ancestors' faith in the sovereignty of God. She said, if God is sovereign, why didn't he stop this? That's how she was thinking. And like her sister Catherine, she converted to Episcopalianism, and her theological perspective grew more and more liberal over the years, and she became less and less concerned with scripture and doctrine and more and more concerned with social issues. She was number seven. The next of the Beecher children, number eight, was the one who gained the most fame in his lifetime, and that was Henry Ward Beecher, child number eight. Now, we're going to look at his life and influence in a bit more detail, but I want to mention now that all eight children so far were born to Lyman's first wife, Roxanna, who went on to bear, bear one more child after Henry, and then she died a year after her ninth child was born. Henry was therefore three years old when his birth mother died, and he didn't retain any clear memory of her, but he had shaped a notion of her in his mind, and throughout his life, he thought about her constantly, he talked often about his emotional attachment to her. I think a psychologist would say that the loss of his mother at such a young age, and then to have her replaced by a stepmother who frankly was less than affectionate, that explains, perhaps, Henry's lifelong craving for female affection. Okay, well, it certainly doesn't excuse his immorality, but it may be a factor in understanding who Henry Ward Beecher was and what drove him. So, so let's breeze through the rest of Lyman's children, and then we'll come back to Henry. So here are the rest. Henry Ward Beecher was born in 1813. Two years and four months later, in 1815, Roxanna Beecher gave birth to the last of her children, a boy named Charles. Eleven months later, she died of tuberculosis. A year after that, Lyman Beecher went to Boston, came home with a new wife, this young single woman named Harriet Porter. And so keeping the Harriet Beechers straight might be a little bit challenge because there's the Harriet who died as an infant, there's the one who grew up and married and became Harriet Beecher Stowe. And then there's this Harriet, Harriet Porter, who was Lyman Beecher's second wife. Harriet Porter had, as I said, four children by Lyman Beecher. But, as I also said, she was not really a warm and affectionate mother. Think about it. She was only 10 years older than Lyman's eldest daughter, who was still a teenager, and the task of being a mother to 12 children seemed a burden she could hardly bear. And so about seven years after marrying Lyman Beecher, she had a stroke that left her mostly bedridden and suffering from permanent migraines for the final decade of her life. Those who were with her when she died said it was a relief to see her die because she'd been in such pain. As I mentioned earlier, she died at the age of 45. 
Her children in order were Frederick, Isabella, Thomas, and James. So three, three boys and one girl. Isabella made a living as a lecturer. She was lobbying for the suffrage movement. And Thomas and James, like the rest of all the Beecher men, became ministers. James Beecher is another tragic tale. He was the last of Lyman Beecher's children. He was 14 years younger than Henry Ward Beecher. And he had a kind of wanderlust, an adventurer's heart, combined with an almost pathological, you might even say antisocial, desire for seclusion. And after he graduated from Dartmouth, he worked for five years in the Merchant Marine, sailing around the world and going as far as Canton, China, and then succumbing to his father's wish that all of his sons would be ministers, he left that life and enrolled at Andover Seminary. His exact words in his diary, oh, I shall be a minister. That's my fate. Father will pray me into it. <laughs> he married while he was in seminary, and then after graduation, he and his wife, her, her name was Anne, they served for a time as missionaries in China, kind of missionaries. I think they did mostly social work. And they returned after less than three years because Anne had become addicted to drugs and alcohol. And she wound up in an asylum in 1860 where she died three years later. James joined the Union Army and fought for the North in the American Civil War. And a year after Anne died, he married a second time, adopted three daughters, and returned to ministry. And although he seemed successful in ministry, there was an 1882 article in the New York Times, I'll come back to it, but th that article described him as, quote, extremely popular and in receipt of a large salary. It, it, nevertheless, he, he wasn't happy in the ministry. He, he struggled with what his biographers called mental suffering. Today we'd call it mental illness. And he even spent some time in the same asylum where his w first wife had sought treatment for her troubles. And then on the evening of August 25th of 1886, James Beecher, quote, this is from that article, suddenly went into his room and taking a rifle, placed the muzzle in his mouth and fired, killing himself instantly. Now, I mentioned that article in the New York Times that appeared November 30th, 1882, so that's just short of four years before his suicide. And the headline of that original article reads, James Beecher's eccentricity, and the subhead says, from a pastorate to a backwoods home and then to an insane asylum. And then it chronicles in a surprisingly breezy tone the downward spiral of James Beecher, who, in spite of his many successes, opted for a life in a secluded cabin in the backwoods wilderness. And the article says, and I'm quoting verbatim, quote, his brother, the Reverend Thomas K. Beecher, believed that James was not exactly in his right mind. And so Thomas believed it prudent to have him removed to an insane asylum, namely the state homeopathic asylum for the insane. So it's a sad story. His antisocial quest for solitude is what convinced his friends and relatives of his insanity. The article says this, and again I'm quoting, quote, his singular freak in abandoning a luxurious home and remunerative charge to live in a cabin in the wilderness was, to many people at the time, conclusive evidence that he was not of entirely sound mind. Now, that might seem like a harsh conclusion to draw from the fact that he liked a life of solitude. I've dreamed about retiring into the woods, too. But... So don't put me in an insane asylum if it happens. But I'm guessing there were actually other things that pushed his own loved ones to the conclusion that he was insane, and I suppose he himself erased all doubt about whether he was sane when he blew his own head off with a shotgun. And that again was 1886, 10 years before that, 10 years before he committed suicide, his brother, the most famous and most notorious of all of the Beechers, had made international headlines in an even more scandalous way. So now let's talk about Henry Ward Beecher. Henry gave no clue as a child that he was going to eventually grow up to be the biggest celebrity and the most articulate speaker in all of the Beecher children. Beecher himself once said in a sermon, I had from childhood a thickness of speech arising from a large palate 
so that when I was a boy, I used to be laughed at for talking as if I had pudding in my mouth. And one of his own aunts said this about him. She said, when Henry is sent to me with a message, I always have to make him say it three times. The first time, I have no manner of an idea more than if he spoke Choctaw. The second time, I catch a word now and then. By the third time, I begin to understand. So apparently, he had a speech impediment as a child, but he outgrew that. And, and the remarkable thing about him is that he was not a student and showed n less intellectual capacity than any of his siblings as a child. He avoided reading, he hated school, and he showed no interest in any kind of intellectual pursuits. Most other people in the family considered him slow-witted. One of his biographers says this, quote, his earliest school days were not such as to forecast a brilliant future for he was deficient in memory, a poor writer, and a worse speller, the smoothness of his Latin exercises showed unmistaken signs of cheating. <laughs> he was painfully sensitive and lacking in self-confidence to the verge of stupidity, unquote. And several articles online uh, include the claim that when he was a child, he was forced to sit for hours in the girl's corner while he wore a dunce cap. I'm suspicious of that claim because I haven't seen it in any of the well-respected biographies, and, and I, don't, I don't see where Beecher himself ever said that. But what he did say was that as a boy, he, what he liked was to play in the woods. You'd think he would be the one to grow up as an outdoorsman and someone who loved seclusion, but he didn't. He loved attention. And with so many siblings and their father, Lyman Beecher, supporting his household on a on a minister's salary, Lyman Beecher's family was actually poor. But the household was always filled with lively discussion and debate, usually theological discussion and debate. Charles Beecher, who was born two years after Henry, said this about his childhood. He said, quote, there was a great deal of intellectual oxygen in the air we breathed. Another brother, Tom, said that the Beecher household was dominated by, quote, long, long discussions, lasting past midnight and resumed at every meal, discussions about free agency and sovereignty and natural and moral ability, interpretations of scripture and such. And Henry himself described his family, these are his words, he said, we were substantially a debating society. And although as a child he might have seemed oblivious to all of this, he was soaking up the content of those theological debates. He was imbibing his father's theological confessional compromises. And he was imitating the doctrines and the debating style of the men who departed from orthodoxy even further than Lyman Beecher was willing to go. And in an 1869 lecture, Henry Ward Beecher said this, quote, my whole life has more or less taken its color from the controversy which led to the division of old school and new school Presbyterians. I was brought up in New England, a minister's son, the son of a minister who was doctrinally inclined and whose warmest friends were great doctrinarians. As early as I can remember, I knew enough to discuss for ordination, and I could do it as well as any of my betters. I could go just as far as they could, I could run against snags at the same spots that they did, and I could not get off any better than they did. Now, reflecting the trends of that era, those arguments would have tended to be philosophical and purely academic and overly intellectual and often tinged with skepticism. The new divinity, the New England theology as it is generally known today, was spiritually sterile, ignoring or questioning key gospel truths like original sin and substitutionary atonement and a sound understanding of justification by faith. So that the New, the new England divinity, the new divinity left the churches of New England and the seminaries spiritually bankrupt by the end of the, the 19th century. And errors of the movement were too often answered by even the best theologians, the old school doctors of divinity, answered these arguments with a kind of academic high Calvinism that frankly lacked any sense of warmth or grace. Remember, it was in this same dry spiritual environment that Finney flourished, stirring the 
religious passions of people at first, but he left most of New England so emotionally spent and so spiritually desiccated that to this day in that part of the country, it's referred to as the burnt over district. So that this dry academic approach to religion where you'd have old men batting doctrines back and forth like sport, it was probably just as much to blame for the decline of theology in America as the shenanigans of Finney. But that is exactly what was cooking in the Beecher kitchen. It's a kind of debate the Beecher children grew up with, and that's why virtually all of them left evangelical truth behind and embraced various flavors of social activism and Socinian doctrine, ranging from, in Henry Beecher's case, sheer pragmatic showmanship, devoid of doctrine, all the way to the most liberal strains of Unitarian belief. This atmosphere of constant debate also infused into nearly every one of the Beecher siblings what one writer described as an air of rhetorical and emotional friskiness. In other words, it wasn't spiritually healthy. And the obvious fact that so, so nearly all of the Beecher children in that generation made shipwreck of the faith, that proves the point. This wasn't healthy. The way theological controversy was treated as sport in his father's house instilled in Henry actually what I would call a contempt maybe for precise doctrine. And frankly, I suspect ingrained in his head was a large dose of skepticism. So that when he reached college age, like all the other Beecher boys, he went away to study for ministry, even though, as he tells the tale himself, he wasn't really a very solid believer at the time. He nevertheless finished his academic preparation for ministry and took the pastorate of a church in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. He was there for two years and then took a church in Indianapolis where he ministered for the next eight years. And then in 1847, he went to Brooklyn to become the first pastor of a new church, Plymouth Church, which is where he remained until his death in 1887. Beecher described himself as having a poetic temperament. He said that he considered Christianity rationally and analytically difficult. His, it, when, when he looked at it rationally or analytically, it would shake his faith, he said. These are his exact words, quote, Logical methods came near wrecking me, for I became skeptical, not malignantly, but honestly. This continued for years, and no logic ever relieved me. My brother Charles went through the same process. An abstract philosophical statement of the truth never met my wants. But when there arose over the horizon a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a living friend who had the profoundest personal interest in me, I embraced that view and was lifted up. My heart did for me what my head had failed to do. Now, if you listen carefully there, you'll understand what he's actually saying is that he prefers the friendly Jesus of his own imagination to the sovereign Lord who is revealed on the pages of Scripture. And that was seen increasingly in his teaching as the years went by. His preaching became less biblical and less doctrinally sound, and in the end, he repudiated the doctrine of eternal punishment, he denied the inerrancy of Scripture, and he scoffed at the exclusivity of Christ. In fact, here's a, here's a sample of his willingness to overrule the Bible whenever he didn't like what it said. This is from one of his sermons. It's a sermon on 1 Corinthians 14, 34, where Paul says, the women are to keep silent in churches, for they are not permitted to speak. Pretty simple, right? He's preaching on that text, and Beecher says, quote, Now, I say that if in the providence of God women are called to preach, if they show that they are fitted for the work, if mankind are called to hear them, if their discourse is accompanied with power from on high, if men who are in darkness are enlightened, if men who are living in torpidity are inspired with a new desire for a holier life, if they reform, then the Holy Ghost bears witness to the validity of the ordination and to a woman's right to speak. When the Spirit itself bears witness, in fruit, to the right of women to speak, who are we that we should stand up and resist God? So he totally dismisses what Scripture says and says, you know, if women can be effective, it's 
sheer pragmatism in a sermon on the very passage that instructs women not to take the teaching role in church gatherings, Beecher comes to the opposite conclusion. In an address he delivered on October 15, 1886, to students at London's City Temple, that was the large church, the other large church besides Spurgeon in London, City Temple, led by Joseph Parker, Beecher spoke there and he mocked the very idea of orthodoxy. He flippantly told the students, quote, orthodoxy is my doxy and heterodoxy is your doxy. He said, I tell you that heterodoxy with a right heart under it is better than orthodoxy with a malign heart under it. Now, when he said that, he was standing exactly a mile and a half north of Spurgeon's church. And so, in fact, keep that and that date in mind. That, again, was October of 1886. Beecher had been preaching for more than 50 years by then, and he seemed to think that his own unshakable popularity gave him license to, make, to take almost any iconoclastic position he, he wanted to, without any fear that he would ever be challenged or discredited. And in a sense, by that stage of his ministry, it is true that he could get away and did get away with virtually anything. Early in his ministry, of course, Beecher had always pretended to be perfectly orthodox. As a younger man, he didn't deliberately push the boundaries of confessional doctrine. He wasn't attacking anything that they confessed. And in fact, even a lot of Baptists in the early years thought, he's a pretty good preacher. And Spurgeon himself must have read books or read sermons, published sermons by Beecher in Spurgeon's younger years, because Spurgeon, as a younger man, would occasionally quote Beecherisms. He used a few quotes and illustrations he borrowed from Beecher in, in Spurgeon's book, Feathers for Arrows. And, and I think Spurgeon, frankly, admired Beecher's courageous stand against American chattel slavery. But philosophically and, and theologically, Beecher and Spurgeon were at the opposite ends of the pole. And by the end of their respective ministries, there was hardly anyone in the evangelical world that Spurgeon would have viewed with more disdain than he had for Henry Ward Beecher. More on that in a minute. But Beecher was a compelling preacher. By all accounts, he was the best orator of his era. He was actually chosen by Abraham Lincoln to deliver the message at the raising of the American flag at Fort Sumter to commemorate the end of the Civil War. Beecher carefully prepared, and he didn't usually, he was a, usually an extemporaneous speaker, but he carefully prepared his message for that occasion. He was convinced that the speech he gave that day would loom large in the retelling of Civil War history, and it was a powerful speech. It has been published. You can download it and read it today, but his great moment in the sun was ruined, and it has been forgotten in the retelling of Civil War history because that very night, Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater. And so instead of coming home as he expected to cheering crowds of celebrating people, Beecher returned early on a rainy day and disembarked from his ship onto an empty pier with the whole nation still in mourning. And, and his great sorrow was that he wasn't going to get credit for this great speech he delivered. He actually complained about it. Well, many of his sermons were published, and they are still available online and in print. There's a few of the, the Bible study software programs that will let you buy Henry Beecher's sermons. I don't recommend it. <laughs> for the most part, his sermons are not grossly unorthodox. They're just insipid. You know, they are flowery and mostly wholesome moralistic thoughts rather than biblical doctrine and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. Beecher's moral lectures often have the thinnest possible connection to Scripture. He wasn't a preacher of God's Word. He was a pulpiteer. He was a pious lecturer. He was a promoter. In fact, pulpiteer, that's what Martin Lloyd-Jones called Henry Ward Beecher, and it was a term of profound contempt coming from Martin Lloyd-Jones, who classified Henry Ward Beecher as a pulpiteer rather than a true preacher. Lloyd-Jones said this, 
he talks about pulpiteers in his lectures on preaching, the famous lectures on preaching, which also has been uh, kept in book form. Lloyd-Jones says, quote, These pulpiteers were to me, with my view of preaching, an abomination. And if you can hear that in Lloyd-Jones's voice, he would spit it out. They were an abomination. Here's how he put it, quote, In the 19th century, pulpiteers were found in great numbers in England and also in the USA. Lloyd-Jones says, I always feel that the man who was most typical in this respect in the U.S. was Henry Ward Beecher. He illustrates perfectly the chief characteristics of the pulpiteer. They were men who would occupy a pulpit and dominate it and dominate the people. They were professionals. There was a good deal of the element of showmanship in them, and they were experts at handling congregations and playing on their emotions. Paxton Hibben, the biographer who wrote that first critical biography of Beecher, Hibben said of him that he was, quote, a great orator, a great actor, a showman. He played the drum major's part in more than one sense. And Hibben called Henry Ward Beecher an opportunist who made no one uncomfortable, least of all himself. And even Charles Finney, who was Lyman Beecher's sometimes nemesis, and who was by no means an orthodox man or a great preacher himself, he took a low view of Henry Ward Beecher's preaching. In Finney's judgment, Henry was too flippant and too unconcerned about holiness, and Finney traced the problem back to Lyman Beecher's influence. He said, quote, Lyman Beecher's teaching, especially in the latter part of his life, has gone to seed in Henry Ward. He said Lyman was preaching a very low standard of piety, but Henry Ward is preaching a much lower standard still. Now, Finney was right, and eventually... Henry Ward Beecher's low standard of piety was exposed to the whole world in what became the biggest church scandal of the 19th century. Turns out that Henry Ward Beecher was secretly a serial womanizer. And to make matters worse, his adulterous affairs tended to involve the wives of his closest friends. In fact, lots of people close to him, including some of the men who he had cuckolded, they knew about his affairs. They ostensibly wanted to protect the reputations of their wives and the women he had committed adultery with, but I think they also wanted to guard themselves from embarrassment. They, they colluded to keep the secret from the press and the public for years until Victoria Woodhull, who was a famous feminist and a spiritualist and a a free love advocate, and not at all a, a savory woman herself. But she got wind of the scandal and wrote about it in a periodical that she published. And at first, even that was met with disbelief, and it was dismissed as malicious gossip, and Beecher's admirers were militant in supporting him. And in fact, uh, attendance at his Brooklyn church went up as a result when the scandal broke. But it got people talking. And Mrs. Woodhull refused to let the issue go, and she started publicly taunting Beecher, telling him he should sue her for libel if, if indeed the stories she was telling were untrue. And they weren't untrue. The woman who was carrying on the affair with Beecher was Elizabeth Tilton. She was the wife of Theodore Tilton. He's got his own Wikipedia entry. He was a famous man himself, a well-known writer and a newspaper editor who was both a friend of Beecher's and an assistant to him when Beecher had his own newspaper. And uh, Mrs. Tilton actually confessed the... She had a tender conscience, kind of, and uh, she was flaky with it because she would confess something and then withdraw her confession. But in 1870, in fact, it was July of 1870, July 3rd of 1870, so that was exactly 152 years ago today, she confessed the affair to her husband. And Tilton, of course, had been suspicious. You could see the evidences of all of this. And he was gone from home a lot, so he was worried about his wife's fidelity. But he worked for Beecher, and he also wanted to protect his wife's reputation. And so even after he learned the awful secret, he kept it under wraps until the story finally broke into an international scandal when I think a well-meaning man in Plymouth Church insisted that this matter needs to be answered and put to rest, which actually blew the cover off the whole case. It's a long story that 
you can read about from any manner of any number of sources, but the upshot of it all is that Henry Ward Beecher was charged with adultery and put on trial in such a public way that the only modern parallel to his trial would be the O.J. Simpson trial of 1995. And in fact, it's a close parallel to that. Beecher's scandal was front page news every day all through the summer and the fall of 1874. And that was before the trial even started. And everyone had complete access to every detail of this scandal as it was unfolding. The actual trial began in January of 75, and it lasted seven months, and it ended with a hung jury. No verdict. News about the trial blanketed the front pages of newspapers worldwide, and in fact, even before the trial began, it just in the year... 1874 alone, the New York Times ran 105 stories and 37 editorials about the Tilton scandal. In fact, one source I read says this, quote, there were more stories in the newspapers of the day about the Beecher adultery trial than there had been about the Civil War during its four years. Now, I have some pages from the New York Times covering this, and I believe that. I don't think that's an exaggeration. All of the testimony from the trial, the complete court record, was put on the front pages of the newspaper. It was also recorded in book form. You can download it yourself from the internet today. And as the story unfolded, it came to light that Henry Beecher had engaged in adultery numerous times with multiple women over many years. And although all of the evidence presented in the trial, as I said, you can read it for yourself. It definitively proves that Beecher was certainly guilty, and he admitted to sins that would disqualify him from being a, a pastor. And so, of course, by any measure, he was totally disqualified from the ministry. But Beecher himself felt vindicated when the jury failed to reach a unanimous verdict, and he carried on in public ministry as if nothing had ever happened. Plymouth Church, his church, pronounced him absolved of all the charges, and they even paid his legal bills to the tune of $100,000, which was a vast fortune in those days. That'd be like $10 million or more today. The newspapers took a dim view of Beecher after the trial. The New York Times acknowledged that the evidence presented in the case, in their words, quote, tells heavily against Mr. Beecher. Another New York paper pointed out that Beecher was, quote, an adulterer, a perjurer, and a fraud. And they rightly said, quote, his great genius and his Christian pretenses only make his sins the more horrible and revolting. And one pundit said this, I love this statement, mankind fell in Adam and has been falling ever since, but never did humanity touch bottom until it got to Henry Ward Beecher. <laughs> Not long after the trial... Elizabeth Tilton, who had confessed and withdrawn her confession several times already, she became so deeply troubled in conscience and fearful that she would die before she actually told the truth. And so she made a formal public statement declaring that the rumors were indeed true and she admitted her own guilt. Here are her words in part. It was a longer statement than this, but here's an excerpt. She says, The charge brought by my husband of adultery between myself and the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher was true. And the lie that I had lived so well the last four years had become intolerable to me. That statement I now solemnly reaffirm and leave the truth to God, to whom I also commit myself, my children, and all who must suffer because of this. And the New York Times printed that and added this, quote, As for Mr. Beecher, he remains the impure and perjured man which any rational construction of his own letters proved him to be. But, and here's the irony, Beecher's popularity in religious circles remained high. You remember I said he spoke in London at the invitation of Joseph Parker in October 1886. That was a decade after this scandal had dominated international news. Everybody knew about it. Spurgeon, of course, by then had zero respect for Beecher. Beecher. 
But Parker decided that the, the visit of Beecher was so successful that he wanted to do it again next year. He wanted to invite Beecher to return for a bigger conference one year later. And in February 1887, just a few months after Beecher had been there, he wrote to Spurgeon, inviting Spurgeon to join Beecher on the platform the following October. And Spurgeon, of course, was outraged. And he wrote a short, very terse note declining the invitation. And Parker pretended to be offended by this. And so he pressed again, and Spurgeon wrote a longer reply. And among other things, he told Parker this, quote, the evangelical faith in which you and Mr. Beecher agree is not the faith that I hold. It is so far off from mine that I cannot commune with you in it. Which offended Parker so badly. Remember, Joseph Parker was the second best known preacher in England. And, you know, among younger people, Parker, even more popular than Spurgeon. He was the cool guy. But he was so offended by Spurgeon's rebuff that when Spurgeon died, Joseph Parker wrote a eulogy that was printed in the paper that was mean-spirited and bitterly critical. I've told, actually, a longer version of the conflict between Spurgeon and Parker in a message that I gave at the Shepherds Conference in 2018 you can Google for that video. It's titled, Whose Church Is It Anyway? And it tells the story of Parker and Spurgeon and the conflict that they had over this. That exchange of messages between Joseph Parker and Charles Spurgeon took place in February of 1887. Just a few days later, in the March issue of Spurgeon's Sword and Trowel magazine, Spurgeon published an article written by a friend and fellow pastor named Robert Schindler. The article was titled, The Downgrade. And it warned about the threat of modernism in the Baptist Union in England. It had nothing to do with the Beecher scandal or any of that. But that is what touched off the famous downgrade controversy, which consumed Spurgeon's energies until he died about five years later. And then just days after the publication of Schindler's article, still in March of 1887, while that issue of the sword and the trowel was just beginning to make the rounds in Britain, back in Queens, in New York, on March 8, 1887, Henry Ward Beecher suffered a stroke and died in his sleep. So Parker's planned conference would have never happened anyway. And yet, Beecher's popularity still seemed unassailable, and maybe even more so after his death. As I said, at the beginning, the early biographies of him were almost entirely laudatory. They totally whitewashed all the scandals and all the, all the filthy issues in his character. And it was not until 1927, 40 years after Beecher's death, that the first critical biography of Beecher, that book by Paxton Hibben, was published, 1927. And Time magazine ran a positive review of the book, which elicited a whole lot of angry replies from people who still believed Henry Ward Beecher was above criticism. I'll read you one of those letters to the editor. This is from a guy with a weird name. I didn't write his name down, but I remember even his name was funny. And here's what he wrote, and it was published in Time Magazine, 1927. I am thoroughly disgusted with Time. My first impulse, after reading page 48 of the October 3rd issue, was to cancel my subscription. That page, with its rehashing of the foul Beecher scandal, would have a familiar setting in the Daily News or the Graphic, but it is altogether out of place in time. For printing such a scurrilous attack upon one of the most gifted and cultured men who has ever appeared in the American pulpit, you deserve to lose many subscribers. And you will. What I regret most is that to the man who doesn't know Beecher, and he's in the vast majority, you give the impression that he was both a rogue and a fool. I wondered at times whether I was reading a review of Henry Ward Beecher or Elmer Gantry. You put them in the same class. He went on. I won't read the whole thing. But frankly, in my judgment, they probably don't belong in the same class. I would say Beecher was worse than Elmer Gantry because of the subtle way he pretended to be orthodox and pure while he quietly undermined the foundations of the gospel and secretly engaged in serial immoralities. Now, think about this. Beecher's pragmatism and his tendency to downplay and shade doctrines 
that he didn't really care for. His belief that the Jesus of his imagination is superior to the Jesus of Scripture. His notion that ministerial success is measured in popular appeal rather than fidelity to the truth. All of those tendencies, all of them, have become the hallmarks of American big movement evangelicalism. We need to get back to the Puritan's high view of Scripture. We don't have to adopt the Puritan culture, but we really ought to share their high view of Scripture. And I need to say, before closing, that there are some aspects of the Beecher family legacy that in the providence of God have borne some positive fruit. You know, the Beechers collectively did play a key role in stirring the passions that ended slavery. One source I read suggested that Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Un Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Henry Ward Beecher's preaching together, the, his preaching against slavery in, in particular, her book and his preaching, though they didn't directly cause the Civil War, the combined voices of those two most famous Beecher children certainly accelerated the nation's march toward war, and that in turn accelerated the end of American slavery. And the rights of women to vote and own property, these were also advanced by the Beechers in their championing of women's causes. Those aspects of the women's movement, I believe, were just and fair. Although I think the overall legacy of feminism has, as you know, actually been detrimental to women. We can debate that later. But as far as evangelical Christianity is concerned, I would argue that the influence of the Beechers has been disastrous, and it continues to be detrimental in American religion even now, more than 135 years after the death of the most famous of all the Beecher ministers. Grace Community Church has always resisted all of those trends, and I, for one, am grateful to be part of a church and under the teaching of a pastor who exemplifies a better and more biblical model of ministry. Thanks for coming this morning. Have a good day.